Currently, uh, I'm focusing on mind trackers and I'm trying to see how can they sort of influence our professional life, the professional sphere, sphere of organizations, uh, and so on. I'm doing this research together with Professor Peter Glor uh, at MIT, Center for Collective Intelligence, and that's where the experimentation will also take place in the coming months. And I hope that we will also add a big component that will be more self-reflective uh, or critical, because I think uh, pure surveys and uh, quantitative work will not be sufficient. So what we're thinking about is how to link uh, tracking, and particularly mind tracking, or uh, neuro tracking, you can also call it, and new um, um, sort of emerging labor, right? Uh, immaterial labor or free labor have, uh, have both been mentioned here already a few times. New forms of organizations, I think we have touched upon that during the previous session also. Uh, and this is uh, something that we are uh, thinking very closely about. And we're also thinking about how to locate really tracking activity and mind tracking in particular within, for instance, the sharing economy as this new paradigm uh, of uh, the way people work, exchange data and so on and all the emerging business models that are related to it, right? Such as on-demand economy, elasticity, data exchange as a form of payment, and so on and so on. And these are, this is like the bigger picture that we're uh, trying to get here from this research, right? So what is interesting for us in sharing economy, obviously you can be very critical of the whole uh, notion of sharing economy and you can, I think, rightfully debate whether uh, Uber, for instance, is a part of it. It surely claims to be, uh, right? Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we know that sharing economy, well, there is something like that for sure happening and this uh, can take a variety of different forms, uh, right? Uh, it can um, be related to nonprofits, corporations, uh, exchange of uh, uh, individual data and so on. Uh, but what is interesting for us is that sharing economy somehow is linked to optimization of resources uh, through redistribution, through sharing and reuse of excess capacity in goods and services and so on. But this whole notion of uh, optimization of resources is the one that is most interesting uh, for us in this research. So we're trying to link this bigger picture um, with the mind trackers that we currently have, right? We have some beta versions, we have some prototypes of newer, let's say, trackers that are supposed to make our minds transparent. So it's not only about the body, <coughs> it's not only about very simple parameters, it's now more about the sphere that has not been, let's say, occupied yet, but it's surely the most interesting one, and this is our mind, the sphere of our emotions, affects, uh, uh, and so on. So I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but I'm using this device for some time now. It's, I think, pretty precise, pretty interesting. It's called Muse, uh, the brain sensing headband, as you can see here. And it's one of those neuro trackers that has actually entered the market uh, successfully, although still, well, mostly interesting, I think, for, for geeks and not for like the mainstream audience that is interested in tracking per se. But nonetheless, it's uh, one of those trackers that uh, has managed to uh, kind of start working and performing, delivering some sort of results. And uh, what is interesting about it is obviously that it's uh, only a headband. If you wanted to have an EEG scan before, you needed a cap like this with so many sensors. Now you're narrowing it down to basically seven sensors only. Uh, as you can see here, two rubber ear sensors, three reference sensors, and two forehead sensors, and that's basically it. To get a pretty, I would say, precise um, um, results uh, of EEG scanning of your brain, uh, what Muse is looking for are two mental states. Uh, your level of focus and your level of stress. It's supposed to be a device that is helping people meditate and that's how it's advertised. But obviously uh, the producers already, the engineers behind it are already talking about how it can have a potential for instance for collaboration and in professional usage too since stress 
uh, let's say, and focus are things that are, I think, very relevant for the sphere of uh, creativity and productivity too. So Muse is on the rise, I think, in many ways. Uh, I think I have also prepared a slide for you. This is my first session with Muse, just to show you very briefly. 0% uh, calm, unfortunately, this is who I am usually, uh, but I got better within time. And here you have three states of your mind, and obviously this is a correlation between those different uh, um, mind, uh, mind waves, sorry, uh, and where you, if you correlate them in a particular way, you achieve this state of calmness. And actually, you know, the uh, perfect usage of Muse would be a one where you have just a flat line here in this, uh, in this area. And if it's so, then it means that you're super creative, super productive at the same time. So, but this was my first session. I will be happy to show you more, but now my students are using Muse uh, for beta testing purposes too, uh, as a part of the experimentation. That's why I didn't bring it with me. There are some others too, like this is Melon. Maybe somebody is familiar with this device. This has been a failure, unfortunately, a failed attempt to introduce a mind tracker that is not going to be used for particular sessions for three up to seven minutes per day, like Muses. This was supposed to be worn all day long, every day without taking off, uh, basically. And it was supposed to be much more complex in the sense that it was supposed to add uh, some uh, more features uh, interact with you in a natural language and you know give you advice for instance how you should uh, work and uh, when you should focus when do you work best and uh, for instance you could turn on classical music because Mellon has noticed previously that this is something that helps you right so it was supposed to be very very natural in, in the interactions with the users it was uh, sold uh, already at the beginning all the all the, all the melons were sold very early uh, as they appeared in pre-sales, but unfortunately they didn't deliver what they promised. And that's why the uh, device is suspended right now, the production is suspended. Uh, this is how um, Muse's, uh, sorry, Melon's interface looks like. I think it's pretty interesting because it was mentioned before that wearable technologies are not so gamified and not so human-centered. Well, I think this one is. Uh, if, you're, uh, if it's shining green light, it means you're focused. If, uh, if it's shining red light, it's, it means you're not focused. This is how rough uh, data is getting translated into the user interface. So you get to have very basic information about how you feel but then you can also fill in um, you know, particular parts uh, of the application with uh, some sort of qualitative feedback on what you're doing, where you are, and so on. And then that is supposed to give you also some uh, more complex information about you know, what you should do in order to improve your focus. Uh, and sometimes if your focus is very low, you should do origami. So that was an additional thing that was uh, showing. So, th but there are many more, right? There are sleep trackers, I think a few of them were mentioned already here today. This one is a Polish one. Actually, it's a Polish startup, uh, IntelliClinic, and this device is called NeuroOn. It was supposed to obviously measure your sleep, but also it was an active device. It was not a purely passive device. It was a device that was supposed to manage your sleep and actually wrap up your sleep to, let's say, six hours instead of eight. If you were usually sleeping eight to 10 hours, this device would allow you to actually squeeze that to four hours and um, make you obviously more efficient through that. Uh, unfortunately, the beta testers after six months started to suffer from some sort of neurological <laughs> disorders and they constantly feel jet lagged. And <laughs> that's why there's also a question mark concerning uh, this device. So this is how the situation looks like with mind trackers these days. Obviously, you will find more of these. And obviously, there is another segment that I did not mention yet that is also related to effective computing, and these are active trackers. So, for instance, transcranial stimulation that is supposed to help you out with being more focused, actively uh, shocking you, for instance, uh, so that you are like more woken up or like you know, you get back to shape. This is another segment that is developing also very, very well, I think, and for sure it's drawing many clients. So, this is pretty much how the how the picture is. And aside from that, obviously, there is also a field of affective computing that is just related to reading emotions from your mimics. So more superficial level, not just directly to the mind, but just on the level of your face, facial expressions. And obviously, this field is very much fueling new wave of neuromarketing. Uh, there are companies such as Affectiva in Poland. We have Ellen. 
and all these are supposed to read your emotions on the basis of how you smile and so on and then pass that information to the advertising agency so that they can optimize, I don't know, a movie trailer or, a, or an advertising for you. And this is something that is also developing right now. Um, one other thing that I think needs to be mentioned is that these devices are also becoming more naturalized in the sense that they become more and more invisible, right? Uh, we have the rise of smart jewelry, for instance. It's smaller and smaller, and, uh, but also very, very functional. This is one of the examples of, I think, a pretty powerful tracker that looks very innocent. Um, also gives you feedback concerning how stressed you are feeling and so on. And uh, there you have an algorithm that keeps track of your vital goal, goals, like uh, how are you doing and so on, how do you feel. Another one for men, actually, this is also a piece of small jewelry that is supposed to um, help you navigate the streets, but is, uh, since it's located here, it also has uh, gets some information concerning your pulse, uh, temperature, uh, skin galvanic reactions, and so on. So uh, miniaturization is yet another thing that needs to be looked into. So um, what we're interested in, you know, taking into account all these different trackers, is how uh, you know, uh, it may evolve in the future, right? Uh, we see that uh, trackers that are, uh, let's say, tracking parameters that correlate best with uh, our mental processes are clearly on the rise, right? So we have a combination of neural tracking and effective computing where we get to have uh, electroencephalography, electromyography, and so on, GSR, breathing, and all of that combined uh, creates pretty powerful devices, right? And all of these devices well, uh, they are here now, they were not here before, but surely they are very much of interest for various employers and bigger organizations. We have seen the introduction of trackers into the professional sphere some time ago already. Actually, one of the first implementations, large scale, scale implementation was here uh, in, uh, in the UK, uh, where uh, in the grocery industry, you would have people wearing trackers uh, and then their bosses would see how many steps they have taken, and uh, according to the information provided in Harvard Business Review, the, the amount or number of full-time employees required to run a big store uh, dropped by 18% because some of them proved to be uh, unnecessary through the tracking for us. So that was a very simple version of tracking, right? Now, obviously in military, um, the usage of tracking has been happening for a while already. Uh, think about exoskeletons that are also full of different sorts of sensors. Uh, but it's not only about productivity, very often it's about health, and health actually uh, gets better responses uh, from the workers uh, than productivity. This, the productivity part is something that people are clearly, uh, on one hand, tempted by, but on the other, also scared of. Uh, right? So you also have companies that are encouraging their uh, workers, their employees to use Fitbit, for instance, um, and th that would be a part of, let's say, the wellness program that they're creating for them. But obviously, um, this data uh, is sort of also not directly accessible for the employer, but on the other hand, they can aggregate uh, sort of big, robust, um, well, big data, basically, insights into correlations between wellness, job satisfaction, financial performance, too, and use that, well, uh, to manage the, the workers somehow, too. Right? So we definitely see things like productivity optimization, evolution of context-aware systems. This is happening, too. And obviously, growing importance of effective computing, right? And our main hypothesis is that something is happening, really, now in the field of how we understand productivity and how we're going to measure it and how we're going to define it. And uh, we are not really sure if it's really new or maybe it's a, a new Taylorism actually that is stepping into the game or new form of scientific management, but there's clearly something going on with the evolution of context-aware systems that are promising more and more, uh, well, complex and sophisticated data about people. Um, so we have asked ourselves a question, how can mind tracking contribute to the emerging models in the so-called sharing economy? Will it rather fuel some sort of form of cooperative individualism, for instance, maybe something that would be, be, we would be sort of happier with? Or would it be rather informing a new form of quasi-corporate collectivism, right? So more sounding like Big Brother. And is there really any 
alternative way of looking at this uh, outside this pure distinction, right? Big brother versus emancipated uh, a group of individuals. This, these are the questions that are driving us, right? The key issues here obviously are uh, transparency, for instance. So whose data is visible? Is it just my data or is it also the data of my boss? Who is really uh, in the game? What sort of role do people play, right? And how is the data aggregated? In a centralized manner, in a decentralized manner, which one is the most prevalent one in the organizations that are either interested in that or are already performing some sort of tracking of uh, people uh, that work for them. And uh, what about responsibility, right? So who is really, really responsible for the data that gets released? And who is responsible for taking actions on the basis of data that gets released? It's also a thing. Is it a distributed or, again, a centralized uh, model? So uh, our approach was uh, clearly mostly about mind tracking. We have taken other versions of tracking into consideration, but less so. We were also looking at, um, let's say, something that we would call humanizing the machine, but a bit differently than in the previous uh, presentation. So we were looking both at life logging, but also at people who are actually able to change the functionality of trackers. So they just don't go beyond, uh, they just don't, you know, stop with uh, tinkering, but they go beyond that and they actually become DIYers and they change the functionalities of devices. In the Muse, for instance, example, you have lots of people who are actually really changing the functionality of this device and they could as well do that in their workplace. Um, and we're really also trying to cover the other side of uh, attention economy. So we see obviously in the professional realm, you would have either the bosses or big companies, uh, right, uh, trying to get their hands on that data. But we would like to understand how people uh, are thinking about their data. Why uh, do they uh, gather that data? Why do they collect them? Or do they think about it as a form of self-care, really, or is it a sort of enslavement? So obviously also some things that uh, have been discussed already in this panel. So uh, initial stage was a survey, um, and I'm not going to really show you that much of it, just a few things. Um, we wanted to see uh, what sorts of wearable devices people were using, what are the habits and motivations of tracking, and if they can really see any limitations and dangers of it. Uh, and then we were planning on to have a bit more of in-depth interviews and experimentation with Muse, as I said uh, before, and some preliminary results. Not all of that is obviously that interesting, but there are a few things that I wanted to uh, draw your attention to. So uh, maybe this one, uh, this chart, what are you quantifying, right? So we can definitely see a certain change here, right? Uh, if, uh, well, I think if we have asked that question uh, had we asked that question a few years ago, uh, we would probably get uh, more responses that are related to physical activity, pulse, uh, BMI, and so on, body temperature. Currently, we're getting sleep, we're getting mood, we're getting mental processes, interactions. So these are sort of new things that are happening that are clearly directing us to the uh, field that is occupied, I would say, by the mind, right? So uh, this is some sort of change that we're observing. Um, some other things uh, that we have asked, is there something you used to track before but stopped? And we would get many responses directing us towards, yes, I did stop tracking physical activity because it was not enough. I wanted to know more. Again, more directing us towards the uh, area of mind, right? Um, so this is something that I obviously can share and send if you're interested. These are just excerpts of, you know, the responses we got. Uh, but maybe one more thing that is, I think, interesting, not how often do you track, but also, you know, you know this one, maybe do you use any devices that enable life logging? We got a growing number of people who are doing it, actually, especially now. Uh, and this one, what is your motivation? Actually, this, I, I think, is the crucial slide for us. Uh, so, why are people doing it? Decreasing stress levels, increasing productivity, enhancement of cognitive abilities. These were the answers that started to show up. Particularly, I think, enhancement of cognitive abilities is, is very interesting. You also have uh, better time management. Uh, you have, uh, let's say, achieving a better balance between work and personal life, uh, and so on. And you get the typical health-related responses. But these three are, I think, very, very uh, provoking. And, uh, and, and very, very interesting, especially that the users declared that they want it for themselves, both in their workplace and in their uh, private life. Uh, so I'll just skip this. 
Um, and I'll stop with, uh, well, yeah. Uh, with maybe some very initial conclusions we had from this survey. So first of all, we have noticed because most of our researchers, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I think I dropped the mic. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, so very initial conclusions uh, we had from, uh, from, from the survey was that, for instance, among the uh, quantified self um, responders or quantified self-related respondents, we have noticed that um, maybe we could treat them a bit as the first wave of tracking and a new wave of tracking that is way more, I would say, broad is coming, right? Um, there was a myth that people get bored with tracking very easily, uh, but it's also true that whenever they get bored with tracking, they come back to it and they want more next time. And this is also something we have noticed. Uh, we have noticed that new wearables with tracking apps implemented bring new broad audiences that do not consider themselves part of the quantified self movement anymore. Uh, quantified self does not overlap, for instance, with mind trackers at all, uh, at least in our study. Um, okay, so among the things that were very important for us, new reasons of tracking, productivity and self-enhancement. Uh, and uh, demanding precise and context-aware data responding to complex process track, right? So this was another thing that has uh, been indicating where the tendencies are sort of going. Well, and having that all in mind, we kind of really cannot draw any conclusions yet, but what we're seeing is that, well, there is a good side to it, sort of, um, because there is a promise of more transparency of very complex processes for people, uh, but also, if you share that data, people kind of were hoping or were indicating that they would be able to build a community of trust. Uh, you can see, for instance, if you go on uh, the blog of Muse, you will see people sitting in uh, sessions. It lo looks more like a therapy session, but actually they're working together. And they're also uh, being tracked by Muse and they're sending each other data, uh, well, directly from their minds. Um, what people were also hoping for was decentralization of power, right? So they thought more self-management on my side, less management on your side, boss, sort of. And also, they were talking a lot about distributed responsibility, so they all felt a part of a grid, right? Where every item is sort of responsible for what is happening, and I thought that mind tracking can actually enhance that. And I sort of thought that there is something related to extended mind argument here, that people kind of feel more like the extended mind, that they're participating in it when they are wearing uh, something like that. But obviously there is the bad side, sort of the new Taylorism that is somewhere lurk lurking from behind here. Uh, and obviously, you know, when you think about what Taylorism did, and when you compare that with, uh, with, with mind trackers and their current promises, I'm finishing, yeah, you can see that, for instance, you have applying of science, rationality, empiricism, elimination of waste, knowledge transfer, high level of managerial control, and detail-oriented detail management. These are the things that Taylorism was pretty much about. And when you think about the functionalities of these devices these days, it's actually, uh, it's actually well, dangerously similar. And the last thing I will say is that there's this great book that I just wanted to recommend. They are really writing pretty thoroughly about the quantified self-movement, its aspirations, and its future to a, a large extent, The Wellness Syndrome by Sedestrom and uh, Spicer. And I think they are very right when they're talking about the corporate wellness as a certain, uh, let's say, way of not really um, nurturing narcissism among people who want to be better versions of themselves, but rather uh, people who have willingly handed over their bodies to the larger cause of productivity. And uh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.